There was a, uh, a couple that I met when I first started going to church back in um, the end of 1989. I started to go to church and uh, I went to a church in Andover, Andover Baptist Church, and I, I, was in, I can remember being introduced to, the, to this guy um, called Jeff. And um, Jeff was having a conversation with me, and he then introduced me to a guy called Greg. And the, the, the cool thing that, that I came to understand about Jeff, and I mean, he must have been in his, uh, I suppose, early 60s, as he's introducing me to, to Greg, who must have been um, early 20s, was the fact that, from what I can remember, Jeff had had a heart attack and collapsed. And Greg gave him chest compressions, kept him alive until the paramedics arrived. And Jeff would say that, and that's how he was introduced Introducing Greg to me, he says, you know, I, you know, I'm here because of him. So whenever Jeff was talking about um, Greg, which he, he spoke about, you know, I, I heard in many different scenarios and situations, he, he was always, always spoke about him with uh, affection, thanksgiving. He always t spoke about him... Uh, with encouragement, the fact that he actually, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this guy. And we're traveling a little bit of a journey over five weeks, and this is week three, of what it is to be church. And we're saying that this is church, but we also recognize that it's his church. It's not our church, it's, it's his church. Jesus is own words, I will build my church, he said. And we're part of his uh, construction program. And in our journey, we recognize that there's some things, we talked last week about fellowship and about building relationships. This week, I just wanted to say briefly that part of his call over us is to acknowledge that we are here because of him. And therefore, he our God is worthy of our worship. Just like Jeff couldn't help but tell me about Greg, what a joy that we have that we might speak to other people about Jesus. And that we would take an opportunity to bring our thanksgiving to him. There's a couple of things to remember that the church is a place of worship. We say that this building is the church. We understand, of course, because of the quality of theological teaching that you receive here, that the building is just a building. It's the people who are the church. We are the body of Christ, and we just so happen to gather in a building. But it's a special building, though, because it is set apart. It's dedicated to be a place where God is acknowledged as worthy of our honor and praise. Activities through the week are an expression of worship as we love on our community. And then on a Sunday, we get the opportunity of coming as the family of God into this place to bring our worship. So it's a place of worship, of service, of extending God's presence in this community. But it's also recognized that, that we're recognizing that we are a people of worship. And it's our privilege and our joy to step into what is the greatest honor that we have, which is to say, God, you are so worthy. I, I can remember, I don't, I don't know which of the boys it was, but 
Um, I'm going to go with Josh, but it could have been Ben. I can remember um, them standing on a chair. We had worship music playing in our house. This is going back several years. We're talking 20, 25 years. The worship music was playing, and um, was it Josh? Or was it? it was Josh. Josh was stood on a chair in the dining room, and we had Hillsong probably playing loud, and he had his hands up in, in the air, and worship. The only thing about it is, he would shout to us and say, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm like Martin Halliday. <laughs> so, Martin Halliday in our church in Haywards Heath was an expressive worshipper. He lifted his hands in worship. There were a few other people at church who used to do it, but the exuberance from Martin. And it's just like school, isn't it? Because when you know the answer, you put your hand up. And when we know who the answer is, we raise our hands. We say, God, you're so worthy. We bring our worship. And God meets us. Whether we are a, a Jeff who's acknowledging the importance of having his life because of what Greg did. Whether we are raising our hands because we've seen that that's the thing that people do when they worship. Or have you ever come into a place, I'll give you confession. I'm gathering with a hundred church leaders in a church over in Kent and I'm not feeling that I'm that excited about being there I, to be honest with you. Was, I, I don't know, a bit tired and it was the morning, I think it was a Wednesday morning. And the church leaders used to gather together at this place and we used, used to have some teaching and, and some worship. And the thing about it is, usually there's, there's a, there was a good band who would lead us in worship. And because it's all church leaders, we used to get quite enthusiastic about things. But this week, the guy was leading worship. It was one bloke on his own. And he was, um, he didn't look like he'd even combed his hair before he came to the meeting. And I can remember him there, and he had shorts on and flip flops. Um, he had a bit of a scruffy beard, unkempt hair, um, and uh, he had two hearing aids. And he was introduced, the guy who was leading the, the, the time together said, I'm going to hand over to this guy who's going to lead us in, in worship. And this guy got up and, and he was fiddling, oh, oh, it annoys me, you know, and you've got all this time to prepare and now you're going to fiddle around with your cables. So all the time, in my head, I'm thinking to myself, this just is going to go nowhere. He's fiddling around, getting his, his guitar plugged in. And then he, he then says, oh, uh, I just want to apologize. He said, um, I, I busted a string getting the guitar out of its case. So I've only got five strings um, and I haven't got a spare. So we're going to be doing it with, with five strings. I'm thinking, oh, my word. And then he did something and I thought, to myself, oh, this is going to, it's getting worse. He said... Um, and uh, I worship a lot better, he says, if I take my hearing aids out, because then I can't hear myself. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and he did, he took both of his hearing aids out, and he put them on, on, on the lectern, like this, over here, and he stands there, and he just said, I want you all to just, just stand. And I'm, think, I'm thinking, as a call to worship, this is probably the worst I've ever, ever experienced. And this guy strummed one chord, boom, and the presence of God in that room became heavy. And I, it, was, it was good for me because I was not in a good place. I was pretty critical of everything running up to that moment and it just hit home to me how gracious God is that when we gather together, he will meet us. 
I don't think we changed song. I think 45 minutes with this aging hippie guy leading us. I, I've got no idea what we sang, but I can assure you it was probably the most intimate, powerful time of worship I have ever been immersed in. As our eyes were taken off of the guy at the front and lifted up to his creator. Worship. I love this story in the New Testament. And it's in Matthew's Gospel and it's also in John's Gospel. And it's all about the exuberance of worship. While Jesus was in Bethany, his favorite town, the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. The, there was a woman who saw the value in Jesus above the disciples who'd been walking with Jesus. She had seen something, she caught something, and her response was, I want to be with him, and I want to express to him something of his value and worth to me. So in a public context, she smashes open a jar of expensive perfume and she worships. One of the things that we've always got to be very aware of is how easily we are derailed in our focus because of what we think others think of us. Martin used to raise his hands in worship at Hayward Heath Baptist Church. Josh used to f copy him. What, what would people do if they copied you in worship? People copied the disciples. But actually, they should have been copying this woman. In John's Gospel, the story is slightly different because it also links into what happened prior to the story. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Now, we're talking, this is going to be a party place. This is a dinner, and the people at the dinner in the place are very aware of one who was dead, who was brought back to life. The story's fantastic. Um, he was raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served whilst Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. You sat down or you're lying down in a room with a person who was dead, who is now alive. Just awesome. Mary then took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume and the call to each and every one of us is to recognize that before we knew Jesus we were dead that's what Paul reminds us of in the book of Romans we're dead in our transgressions and our sins but he has made us alive as I'm looking around the room I'm looking at people who are alive that were dead you were dead. I, I love the bit when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And in the King James version of that scripture in, in uh, John 11, it talks about the fact that he had been in the tomb for four days and he stinketh. Smelly. We were smelly. Dead. Smelly. Yet. Jesus raised us. And we're given the opportunity, just like Mary in this story, to break open that worship. And you know, when you were dead, and now you are alive, 
you don't care what anybody else around you thinks about how you respond to your Jesus. Because before your encounter with him, you were dead. You were stinky if. One of the disciples, Judas it was, who was there and was going to betray him, he objected. He said, why, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a, a year's wages. Everybody will have a different opinion about what we should be doing when we're worshipping. You know, when you're worshipping, why you, why you spend so much time in worship? Don't spend so much time in worship. You shouldn't be worshipping all the time. You should be doing stuff. Well, actually, our priority is to worship. That's our calling, to worship. And out of our worship, the overflow is the other stuff. Never put the stuff before the worship. The story in John 12 is preceded. I don't know if you know how it works, but before 12 is 11. Let me read to you from John uh, chapter 11. These verses are, I mean, you know the story. Verse 38, it says, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. He was called to come because his friend has died. So he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus says, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. This is New King James, you see. For he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from that place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I want to thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this. That they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him, let him go. And I'm going to hand back to Josh and to Flory and the worship team. And my prayer today, as we think about worship, is that we would all together recognize that Jesus has called us out. You were dead. Now you're alive. And he has called us out to bring our worship. And in calling us out, we recognize as well that when we step out of the darkness, when we step out of the life that was no real life, there are still the trappings that bandage us up and restrict us and hold us. And in our worship, my prayer is that you would help me to remove the restrictions, the bandages. That I might have the honor of, in my worship, releasing you in your worship. You see, I find it so hard to be worshipping with words like you have saved me you have given me life you are my saviour and my lord with my hands down and it's almost like there's this spiritual bandaging that needs to be unravelled that we would find ourselves truly acknowledging just like Jeff did that if it wasn't for Greg he would be dead if it wasn't for Jesus, we'd be dead. And when we get this opportunity of coming together, 
to bring our worship. It's freeing, it's liberating. And it gives us this moment where we can say, I'm retuning and giving you, Lord, all of the honor, all of the glory, all of our attention. Doesn't matter what you've been through, doesn't matter where you've traped this last week, when you come together as God's people, this is the point where we just say, no, it's about you, Lord. Jesus invites us into his presence to bring him worship. These words I just read to you, the dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. As we worship now, Recognize that your brothers and sisters in Christ are here to help you to remove the grave clothes of restriction. That's every lie the enemy will be telling you of why you can't bring your worship. We take that off in Jesus' name. Every restriction that being a good British, although we've got South Africans and New Zealanders and, and Germans and all, all sorts of oh, cosmopolitan gathering of people here. Whatever our community restrictions have been placed upon us subconsciously, we're going to unwrap them this morning and just say, I want to be free in my worship because worship is what we've been created.